Good morning. Welcome to MS There is Hope. Our guest this morning is Dr. John Zabonovich. Dr. Z, we'll call him because I'm the only one that really knows how to pronounce that name. If you people saw it, you wouldn't be able to pronounce it. Good morning, Dr. Z. Good morning. Uh, we're going to uh, read a little disclaimer here, and today we're going to uh, look at some more tools about uh, just better mental health because with MS, we have a lot of, of challenges. And uh, John's going to, Dr. John's going to fill us in a little bit about how we can uh, improve our mental health. This interview addresses chronic disease and some stresses or mental health dilemmas that can be encountered by combating it. We're not giving advice nor addressing specific cases, but are speaking in general about some issues that we may have incurred or experienced. Uh, difficulties and methods of treating uh, them can vary significantly per individual. For this reason, we strongly recommend that anyone seeking treatment consult a licensed medical or mental health professional. Again, good morning, Dr. John. Thank you for joining us. Sure, good to be here, John. All right, jump right in. Well, I think, yeah, one of the things that you and I discussed a while back when we were kind of unpacking is kind of a dispositional perspective on having MS. Like, so if you have MS, uh, the last thing I want to do is um, kind of say that that's not a big deal or whatever. That, that's silly. I mean, it's a very big deal if you have that. I mean, um, you know, I mean, I still have diabetes, you know, and so I, so for somebody to go, well, it's no big deal or whatever would be really to kind of minimize, you know, the disease that I have. I mean, I've got it controlled and all that, but I mean, before that, you know, it was, it was tough, you know, it was, it was hard. It's, it's done damage to my eyes and my nerves and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, so we want to be real careful, but I think a dispositional perspective that is a healthy one is a dispositional perspective of humility. So humility, and I think it's really important for me to define it. I'm going to just kind of give you a real simple kind of definition of humility. It's an accurate view of oneself, an accurate view of oneself. Now, in order to help you understand humility, let me give you two, both sides of the opposite side of the coin, so to speak. One would be pride, which is an inflated view of self, like you think you're better than everybody. Usually it's like, you know, people that are prideful, well, I don't have this disease, I'm going to be fine. It's going to be, you know, that's, that's not realistic. No, you have MS and you need to be, have an accurate view of yourself. So pride is an inflated view. You know, we've met all the people that are prideful, right? Not all the people, but we've met people that are prideful. Oh, I'm the best person in the world. Well, there's over 7 billion people. How can you quantify that you're the best person in the world? I, I just call me a skeptic, but I just don't buy it. So most people don't struggle with pride, I think, you know, in at least in my interactions. But a lot of people struggle with false humility. False humility is a deflated view of self, right? Not an accurate view of self, not an inflated view, but a deflated view of self. That is, it is literally the flip side. If I had a coin and on this side of the coin, heads would be pride. If you turn the coin over, tails would be false humility. It's the same coin. Why? Because it's minimizing and rejecting the core of who you are. You have strengths. You have weaknesses and you learn how to navigate those. Now, if you come from a faith tradition or whatever, you can utilize that as part of your equation to be able to sort out in humility how to be able to act accordingly to your faith tradition. All that. But the fact is, is that, you know, humility is an accurate view. You know, uh, for example, I, I'm a left handed person, right? I've been, you know, about 5% of the American population is left handed. So I may want to be right-handed. I may try to convince everybody I'm right-handed, but I'm a lefty. I'm just, I'm just a lefty. So no, what I do is I just own it. I'm a left-handed person, right? You know, I have blue eyes. You know, I maybe I want a difficult. So it's just an accurate view of yourself. Now, in order to be able to do that, and so you're going, because we're kind of theoretical, right? It's a dispositional perspective. How do we have humility? Here's what I would really recommend in a practical way. Get out a piece of paper and write down your strengths 
all the strengths that you can think of, like you're friendly, you're kind, you're thoughtful, you're engaging. And I don't mean some of the time, but as a general rule, what is, you know, what is your personality and really deal with your character issues like hard, you know, hardworking. No, that's a good work ethic, you know, kind and compassionate. Where does that come from? Thoughtfulness. You know, what's, what's the character in you that drives these particular behaviors that will help you understand yourself more. And then also your weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is I am not, I am not a detailed person like at all. I mean, not, not at all. Now, what's fascinating, my wife is, and I've learned from her over the years, but, but in reality, at the end of the day, I'm a big picture guy, but I'm not a detail guy, you know? And so if you want me to do details, I can do details, but they'll probably take two to three times longer than the average person that enjoys details. Well, that's one of my weaknesses. Okay. You know, I, I need to be aware of that. And it's not like saying, well, I'm not going to work on it. No, I'm aware of it. But watch this. This is important. A lot of people want to spend, and I should say a lot of Americans, because I think this is more of an American phenomenon, spend a lot of their time trying to shore up their weaknesses. Can I be honest with you? It's a waste of time and money. You, you know, you have weaknesses to keep you humble and accurate view to keep you in place, recognizing you've got strengths that are wonderful and you've got weaknesses. Your weaknesses are there. It shouldn't be that you're not mindful of that. If you're notoriously late, you can begin to work on trying to be on time. You know, there's things like that you can work on. But I mean, to really change your character, you're not going to become a super organized person if you're not an organized person. You're just not. But <clears throat> take the same time and energy, effort, and resources and put it toward your strength, and you will potentially see a double or triple. Right? Why? Because you have strengths. So write down your strengths, write down your weaknesses, and come to terms with those. Be okay with it. You don't have to have it all together. You know, for example, you know, if you go anywhere, you know, we're always on Facebook. Let, let's just use Facebook as an example. I mean, the majority of people on Facebook are telling you about a life that they wish they were living. They're not actually living. Yeah. You know, I mean, they tell you about how wonderful their kids are when they're not wonderful at all. They're hellions, you know, and all that. Why? Because what they're trying to do is that that's a <clears throat> that's a real insecure view or a prideful view of reality of life, which, by the way, speaking of that in the mental health area, pride is I've seen is most usually fueled by insecurities. You're insecure about something, so you feel like you have to overdo it, overinflate it whatever because you're into just it's okay you have strengths you have weaknesses you are uniquely you <clears throat> because <clears throat> the things that make you uniquely you is not only your strengths and weaknesses but your family of origin where you grew up the different relationships you've had with cousins siblings parents in-laws outlaws however everybody's kind of different and yet we're pretty similar and so the fact that i, I love this question when you ask somebody how you doing you know, when I ask my clients, because they'll come in, they'll sit down. I have a couch, they sit down, and, uh, and and I'm in the chair, and I said, so how are we doing this week? And, they, and you know what their response is? Fine. It's it's what everybody said. And then he, I ask this question. I say, what does fine mean to you? Oh, well, now we're starting to open the bag of tricks, you know, because they're beginning to open up about what's what's the deeper issue, right? You know, well, well, it was fine, pretty good today was, but yesterday we had a big blow up and okay, then we're, we're able to kind of hop in it. But fine is kind of like this trite way of like, don't bother me. So I'm just going to tell you what you want to hear. Everything's fine. But the truth is that's not necessarily the case. Now, I get saying that you're fine when there's people you don't know really well. Like you, you see somebody you haven't seen in a month at the grocery store. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. You don't need to be bragging about stuff that's not truthful. Be honest. Yeah, my kids are right now, they're struggling with some things academically. They're working on some things. All that. Well, they're the bet they're on the honor roll. No, they're not. You're lying. They're not on the honor roll. You know, and all that. you don't need to tell them that they're struggling with an addiction if they are struggling with an addiction. What you need to do is just say they're struggling in life, you know. And so you, you know, you get to decide that. But to say that everything's great and fine and perfect in your family when you know it's not. That doesn't help the cause toward humility, this dispositional move to humility. 
you don't need to share everything unless they're people that you really trust. And you, we're all going to have some people like that in our life that we really trust. And then don't hold back. You know, vulnerability is the key to seeing change in your life. But vulnerability comes with risk. I mean, there's a huge risk. If I'm vulnerable, if I share really how I'm thinking, how I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing, I risk you rejecting me for who I am. Risk it anyhow. Why? The consequences are horrible. You become isolated, alienated, alone. Why? Because you can't feel like you can talk to anybody. There's nobody available for you. You literally find yourself like the polar bear, literally on that ice chunk going out into the ocean all by yourself. You're the only one on it. And then it's like, how did I get out here? Well, you keep telling yourself that long enough. That's where you go. So you want to, vulnerability is huge opportunity for our for growth, development, nurturing of relationship. But be aware of this. It comes with risk. You know, I'm glad always. that you said that because I think that a big part of having a chronic disease like this and seeing things go away is that we 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 want we want things to be normal. We don't want to say somebody, well, they ask you how you're doing. Well, I went to the bathroom on myself yesterday. We don't that's something that we need to know there are others out there right like this right. and one thing that happens whenever you get ms is you mask all that you don't you don't say that you fell down five times yesterday and right. you, you don't you don't mention those so being vulnerable is, is really key i think well um, and again john you don't want to mention that to everybody like for example you meet somebody at the grocery store you haven't seen them oh by the way i peed on myself yesterday okay they don't need to know that, right? Because people that are not trustworthy will take that and manipulate right. it. Oh, by the way, they're really struggling with their disease and all that. No, no. People you trust, you want to be vulnerable. Yeah, I, I really had some bladder issues yesterday and I peed on myself once and they get it, <laughs> right? They're not laughing. They're, they're, in, you right. know, they're with you. They understand. Hey, I fell down five times. Just, are you okay? You know, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, I was able to get up. I'm okay. I, I'm a little sore today. You got to have somebody to talk to. But but that is usually a smaller group of people. Usually where anywhere from one, it could be one other person. Hopefully it's your spouse um, to as many as maybe five to 10. Much beyond that, you got to remember in relationships, there's deep relationships, which are very few people in that. Then there's kind of these medium relationships where you can go a little deeper and you can be surfacey. And there's a few more people than that, but then there's a lot in the surface. You know, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. You know, I'm just, I'm working through some issues with my MS. They don't even know that they peed themselves, right? You know, because that's just information that the general public, the surface people don't need to know. But you can be honest to saying I'm having some struggles with my MS. You know, but but I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm on this new protocol and I'm seeing some good successes. But, you know, in that there's always some struggles. With. So that that's to me vulnerability. But what you need to do is be vulnerable to the degree of the relationship. Don't go deeper if you have a surface relationship with this person. Why? Because then you will go, you'll say this. They hurt my feelings. They told other people, you know, and then you isolate yourself. Isolation is whenever you have a chronic disease, one of the things, cancer, MS, whatever, is there's already a struggle to be open and honest about it. You're already kind of isolated and alienated a little bit. Well, what you don't want to do is kind of hurt yourself by alienating yourself more by telling information to people that quite frankly shouldn't know. Does that make sense? I, absolutely. You know, when you were saying that, remind me of there's people in this world that you don't want to ask them how they're doing because they're going to tell you. Yeah, and, I call them their bleeders. <laughs> They'll bleed all over you. You know, you give them a hug and you're just drenched with blood. They just bled all over you, man. They're leeches. They'll suck you dry. Whatever, well, whatever the metaphor is. I think that's excellent advice. I think that... Um, I, I think we need somebody to vent to, and it's very important, but we don't need to vent to everybody, that's for sure. But we need to be humble enough to understand there's other people going through yeah. what we're going through. It. Absolutely. And some of the best people that you can vent with, process with, 
interact with regarding MS is people that understand your journey. I yes. mean, they understand it like no one else does. Like, for example, John, I mean, you and I, we, we go back to high school days and we, you know, we knew each other there and all that. But as much as you can tell me about MS, I don't understand it like you do. You know, as much as I can tell you about diabetes, you'll never understand it like I do. But for you to share with somebody else that has MS, now, again, remember, they could be surfacey people, they could be middle of the road people, or they could be deep. If they're deep people, then go ahead and process how you're feeling. Man, I'm really, you know, I kind of had, you know, I peed on myself yesterday and I really was embarrassed. You know, so I can't even begin to tell you how embarrassed it was because I actually did it in public. Nobody knew and all that, but it was so embarrassing. Well, you don't share that with surfacey people. They, they don't need to know that. You know, they even don't really care. Right. Even even people that have MS, because they may never have experienced that yet. You know, and exactly. so you've got to just be really good steward of your your soul, your emotions, your emotional well-being. Nobody else can steward it better than you can. Well, Dr. Z, thank you for being with us this morning and uh, giving us some good advice there, I think. I look forward to, we'll try to do this again once a month if you're available and um, get some more input from you and hopefully learn something in the process. Yeah, man, we'll, we'll work on something, huh, brother? All right. Yep. Take care. Thanks a lot. Okay. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for your time.